Hello and welcome to yet another episode of These Corona Times. You are tuned in with Mr. Brandon. Let's start with him first. With his well, head cut off. With his head cut off. With his head cut off. With his head cut off. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> there I am. There I is. Yes. <laughs> That's the... Tune in with your folks, Mr. Brandon, Dr. Bruce, Dr. Simone Bruce. And your girl, Tiffany, we are here and back again for another episode of These Corona Times. We have been away for a while, and yes. you know, I've missed y'all. Definitely. Yeah. Missed y'all. Yes. I mean, we've talked to y'all. We've talked to each other, but I've missed being here with, because the last time we did this, it was, it was girl. Cheyenne. Mm-hmm. No, Brandy. Yeah, yeah, so. It was a very peaceful episode, but, you know. Uh, everybody was paying attention yeah. and, you know. we had some stellar orienting you know it was awesome <laughs> the jokes the jokes just but i take that because i know it's all in love mm-hmm. <laughs> see folks we told y'all he don't watch if he would have watched them so he would know that we was shouting him out and everything on there but nope he didn't, he didn't watch. watch it's okay it's fine okay. all right so i forgot <laughs> we'll send you a link Yes, Simone will send <laughs> <laughs> to your own show. <laughs> of um, thank you all for watching these Corona Times for sticking with us. We are on episode 49? 49. 49. 49. On episode 49, we're talking about balancing church and state in these Corona Times. And I will not tell you anything else about that because I'll let Simone and Brandon do their jobs on this evening. Um, but instead, I will just welcome you and say thank you again for the consistent followership, for watching, for listening, for subscribing. And if this, is your, if this is your first time and you have not liked or subscribed yet, then please do so. You can find us on our Facebook page at These Corona Times. You can find us on YouTube under, by searching These Corona Times. And then also anywhere playlists or podcasts, excuse me, anywhere podcasts are heard, um, either on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify or you know, any of the other ones you like, but those are the two of our favorites. So you can always check us out there. And to reiterate, you know, again, based, you know, really shout out to the support. I still get notifications of folks liking the page on Facebook. And uh, so thank you all for that. Yes, absolutely. I got one today, I think. And for us, I mean, that's a big deal to slowly, steadily get likes. That's a big deal. So we're happy that you all are watching. We appreciate you. Um, so how did you all practice self-care last long. week? It's been a long time. <laughs> was, was, any, was any self-care done? I'm trying to think. Yes. I will say that I have been sick the last couple of days. And so I have been, um, usually when I get sick, I try to just kind of plow through and I don't take the time to rest, but we have to listen to our bodies. And so I've been, you know, taking time to take naps. I've invited my family to do the same. Caden has not been happy with taking the naps, but I needed it. And I can't sleep unless he sleep. So, <laughs> so I've been doing that and just trying to kind of slow down and just rest. So I would, I would say that that's my self care, and I'm, I'm just getting better at listening to my body. I haven't done nothing. I don't. I'm not. I'm not where the self care resides. Any so. front on the king? No, because we've we've gone back to uh, working in the building. Um, this was our first week, actually. So I'm just trying to adjust and find my my fit. I mean, I'm fi- I feel fine. I'm not neglecting myself, but I haven't done anything. Other than catch up on all the TV I missed this week, you know, <laughs> just kind of. Are it. you mourning? Are you mourning the loss of 100% work at home? I am. Are you in grief? I'm in grief. I'm <laughs> and maybe why I'm not taking care of myself because I'm I'm begrieved. Um, although I have missed my office, I, I like the space and the quiet and um, the drive in and home is is always really important. It kind of helps you get you focused and get ready for the day, but. I'm begrieved because with more travel comes more gas, and we know how much gas costs. This is terrible. So I'm not right there. Yeah, man. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Costco. You ain't garbage bag me up no gas though, so I don't want to talk to you about it. Right, because I'm, <laughs> I'm not, not trying to blow myself up. Why not? Yeah. It works for the other people. <laughs> Did it Only go? like two people blew up, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, Brandon. <laughs> Only two. <laughs> <laughs> That's too too many. <laughs> What about you, Brandon? How did you practice self-care? I actually have been practicing some self-care. And uh, the main self-care for me, and a little backstory is, you know, my job as a trainer, a health coach, requires me requires me to be very flexible with my uh, with my scheduling. 
I work when a lot of people are not working, right? Uh, so i um, been very, very, very blessed and fortunate that I have not, that I am not working on Sundays anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty big deal because I've been working Sundays literally from Sunday through Friday uh, for the last 10 years. And uh, it's, a, it's a big deal, you know, so I was able to get up today, uh, flip in, clean the house, took the kids to swim lessons, chilled out with them at the house and, and just had a full day. And so that's, uh, that's, that's my felt care. Cause normally I would have been like, well, I got to cancel next month. I can work these six days, but I'm just like, you know what? Let me just, as Simone said, listen to my body, listen to my mind and just really just cut that day out. You know, Absolutely. You know what? Brennan just reminded me of something. I listened to my body today and I slept in as well. And I think that is self care. It is. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yep. Yo, I slept I think, until like nine thirty. Okay, well, that's beautiful. I'm not gonna talk about what time I woke up today. But. No. <laughs> I think the three of us, we 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 could always stay up longer and stretch ourselves longer to make more money and to do other things. But it's not all about that. It's really about taking care of ourselves as much as we can. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to hear that you have your Sundays off. Me too. Um, and hopefully that means the kids will sleep hard. Yeah. You know. We can only hope. We can only hope, you know. Um, in their juice. What? Right. No. Don't no. Naturally. I don't like in the juice, though. Drop it in there. That sounds... That sounds real. I'm not going to even say it, but it I sounds... I mean... <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> it, sounds... it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't sound like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... <laughs> I think me and someone thought at the exact same time. Mm, yeah, and, and made a different decision about what to say. Um, so we always, always acknowledge folks in our community doing good things in the Black community. And so this week we are acknowledging um, my, uh, let's say, I'll say the book. It's a book. It is a devotional. It's called Getting Out, Stepping into the Unknown with Faith. It is a book co-authored by Terry R. Jones and my cousin, uh, Bryant A. Stewart. So Getting Out is a 30-day devotional. It is an up uplifting devotional from pastors Terry Jones and Bryant A. Stewart. As a follower of Christ, it will challenge you to believe and trust God to do what he has promised in your life. Um, so I'm super, super proud of my cousin to have um, co-authored this devotional. Um, and so, yeah, we wanted to share that with you all. You can find it on Amazon. There may be other venues, but you can go on Amazon, put in the title, um, getting out, stepping into the unknown with faith, and you'll find it. And um, he's on, if you know Brian, you know he's on Facebook and all the socials. So we're very proud of him. He's also a friend of our show and former guest. We had him on uh, very, very, early. Beginning. very early. One of our first five or 10 episodes, we talked about the church and COVID. So if you all remember, if you are a long time listener, subscribers and remember that name, that's from where that's from as well. Yes, for sure. So very proud of them. Um, and so I'm going to, gosh, Brandy, you might have been right about the orientation. I'm going to go ahead and introduce the speaker. He's going to be coming on. We're so excited. So <clears throat> we're having Pastor Finley. Pastor Tim, uh, Tim Finley um, on tonight. He is a pastor and community activist who is currently running for mayor of Louisville, Kentucky in 2022. Tim Finley uh, Jr. hails from the Newburgh neighborhood of Louisville, Kentucky. Raised in a faith-filled working class home, he was taught to be honest, fair, to do things the right way, to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, to defend those who are in need, to speak up for those who have been mistreated, to show respect for the lives of others and value education. To Pastor Finley, this can all be summed up as love God and love people. Tim is a graduate of Moore High School and is seminary trained. Tim's vision as mayor is to cultivate a Louisville that uplifts the voices of all people where every person is seen and heard, respected and valued. He believes Louisville deserves a government that invests in and defends its people, all of its people. His goals include making home ownership affordable and rent accessible for all, promoting urban revitalization without gentrification, eradicating our houselessness crisis, 
transforming policies, attracting and cultivating talent, boosting small business community, and promoting solutions that address the social determinants of health for poor and working class people. Um, and so you can find Pastor Tim Finley at um, Finley number four mayor.com. And I'm sure we'll put that up so you all can see um, the website. So we're super excited to have him here with us tonight. He'll be on soon after Brandon gives us a brief orientation. I mean, so, what Brandon, else do I have left to say? This is no, your no, best no. shot. No, again, I'm going to miss this. Simone did such a great job. Uh, so in the very beginning, we just talked about Brian Stewart coming in, uh, one of our earlier earlier guests, and he was talking about how we were addressing the COVID. And now that we're not post-COVID, because COVID is still out here, Delta, Lambda, whatever. Plus, plus. COVID is still out here. Extreme. <laughs> Delta is still out here, but we have loosened restrictions and we're starting to go into churches, into the church houses and everything like that. And so we wanted to get the perspective of uh, another pastor and what has changed. How are you? Um, how are you adjusting? Has there been growth? What are you going to have to do to retain? You know, reduce attrition. You know, those type deals as well. So it's awesome that we have such a great pastor that and that's not just uh, that has a church that's full of millennials. That's also that also has some of your older older groups as well. So getting his perspective is going to be gold for us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know not to not to second or add anything to Brandon's orientation because but you always, are they're always so great but just to say that it is wonderful to have a guest who is um social socially active in our community mm -hmm. like just mm -hmm. out there in the protest um who has been working you know before even announcing his mayor I think that's one thing that's kind of caused him to catch my attention is that he's been out here working getting arrested marching you know he's been doing the things um, so it's awesome to have his perspective, not only on this church discussion, but then also on like mm -hmm. someone who's actually running for a political office in our city. And even mm -hmm. even add that because I want to have the last word. <laughs> 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 I um, I met Pastor Finley probably four, three to five, three to four, three to five years ago. He was one of the organizers for the uh, black men greeting the kids at the schools. And so on the first day of schools, uh, certain certain people, we would just go to different schools or go to, to a school that day and just cheer the kids coming in. And it was a great experience. And it kind of was like, man, that's a really dope idea for him to be one of the people to organize that. He's always kind of been in the back of my head, especially now, now that he's uh, running for mayor. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I men mentioned this, but he's the pastor of... Um, Kingdom Fellowship. I don't think I specifically said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Simone got the last word. I didn't. I didn't want the last word. I was just trying to. It's all clarify. good. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> well, I'll get it. We'll be back with our guest, Pastor Tim Finley. <laughs> all right. So as Tiff says, our boxes have gone from three to four, and we have Pastor Finley on with us. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about your. Um, about your campaign and also just talking up to us about, you know, being a pastor and all the different things that you're juggling. We appreciate you being here. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Honored to be on with you all and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Me too. Me too. And may I say, I like your shirt a lot. I love your yeah. shirt. Yeah. yeah. You got to represent. We still yeah. need justice. Still need it, friends. <laughs> still waiting. Still mm. waiting. Yeah. And we, we said a lot of nice things about you before you got here. <laughs> Um, we tend to do Your that. Your checks are coming in the mail. Your yeah. checks will be there soon. <laughs> but you know, I want to add that um, uh, we worked with Pastor Finley a few months ago on an event at the University of Louisville where he was one of our guests. Simone is also was a panelist as well, where we talked about um, COVID vaccination and how important it was. So that's really been, other than like knowing you and seeing you vicariously throughout the city and knowing you through my husband, that was like my first interaction of working with you. So I really appreciate you taking the invitation and coming with us today. Yeah, no, that was a great event too. And I was honored to be a part of that. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that we believe in and it's something that we all need to do. So mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we always start with guests. We ask them how how you're doing. And it's kind of a loaded question because 
in the pandemic and we're still in it. Some people it's controversial. Mm-hmm. Some people say it's over. Some people don't say it's are over. Done. We're, we're still I'm not done. Delta but... Lambda Phi is still out here. Right. Yeah. yeah. So how are you doing? Yeah. How are you doing everything? I'm doing well. Um, like you said, we are still in a pandemic. Um, we are still, as we've alluded to already, still wanting justice for Breonna Taylor. Mm-hmm. Um, we're still seeing all of the um, same elements, you know, of racial injustice um, that are alive and present today. And then, of course, I am running for mayor. So there's a lot of different things going on. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm doing good. I'm, I'm blessed to have a really, really good team around me that, that helps to hold me up. That's awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, it's, I dozen all those hats, man. I just can't even imagine. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, man, I, I think, you know, I'm one that I really, really believe in teamwork. Mm-hmm. I believe in surrounding myself with people that do things better than I do. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really, that philosophy has helped me a lot. Um, and they make me look good. You know, they, they, they make me to stay on, they help me to stay on track. Um, and really try to be in the places I need to be in, um, be prepared to be, um, and have conversations where I need to have those. And, um, and, and it's just, it's a blessing to have them. So, but even with the team, it's still a lot. It's, mm-hmm. And I'm a father of a 20 year old daughter um, who, you know, is still viewing me as an ATM. So it's all, <laughs> yeah, that's probably the main thing. <laughs> that's what we have to look forward to, Brandon. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's what we have to look forward to. Our children will be grown and still Listen, like this. It never changes. Huh? It never changes. My daughter is 20 and <laughs> she uh, cash after me today as I was Quest. walking up to preach. Your request as love. I was walking up to preach, yeah. she cash after me for gas money to come to church. <laughs> I was going to say, maybe it's <laughs> now here's, for the offering. Here's the problem. I just cash after her for dinner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's at this point it's just cash app to do any I need cash app for dinner, cash app for gas and I'm asking where's your money go through, going to and she says I'm saving oh. so you have money I'll she your she money. Money. in your money <laughs> so yes. yeah so you all have to look forward to that that's what's going to happen, right. I wish it upon you two and three times uh, what no. I'm doing <laughs> I'm going to testify that I'm going to tell you don't, I, you still got some time, my sister's 27 and she cash out my mama daily <laughs> yeah that's exactly it that's it okay. that's it <laughs> well, so, you, I, I had a question i'm already going off the path i'm yeah. i'm terrible about this i'm so yes, bad i don't know i know but i have to ask because you said something a second ago that kind of spoke to it, to me it, talk, it kind of spoke to humility so you said i like to have people around me that do things better than i do everybody is not open to that it takes a level of humility i think um, so I think I wonder, like, how did you, have you always been that way? Or did it take some time for you to get there? Well, I, I think absolutely it takes a level of humility, but I would say even more than that, it's because I embrace reality. Mm-hmm. And in reality, we don't do everything at, you know, top notch level. We're not experts in everything. We don't, we don't mm-hmm. excel at everything, even if we think we do. And I mm-hmm. think what has helped me succeed in areas that I've, I've found success is um, I've, I've followed those words of my mentor that you staff into your weakness, mm-hmm. that you fill those weaknesses with people around you that do things better than you do. And I think when you have a sense of, when, when you're not struggling with insecurity mm-hmm. uh, and you have a vision of who you are and where you're going, then you're not, you're not going to find yourself in a position to where you are easily intimidated because this person does something better than you do Mm -hmm. you know the biggest thing is to make sure that the team is on the same page and if we're all you know trying to strive and achieve the same goal then it it helps the team it helps our our mission and what we're trying to accomplish so that's Mm -hmm. something that I've always done my parents have taught me that my mentors have taught me that and it's just it's worked Um, and when you ask someone how they're doing I can say I'm doing good and not be lying. Mm-hmm. Now, if I'm out here just trying to do everything and just take everything on my shoulders, and there's a good chance that I could find myself in a much darker mental place yeah. because I'm trying to do so much. Um, and I think that that's a biblical principle as well, that 
you know, you got to have the right people around you. You got to have people and, and you can't be so insecure because um, mm -hmm. you don't get things accomplished. Even Jesus had disciples. Like that. Even Jesus had to stand. <laughs> yeah. And some of them was crazy. And, yeah. he, and some of them was crazy. Yeah. But you know yeah. what? But you know, all of them. Really, all of them. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but all of them. <laughs> so it sounds like you have a good sense of balance. You know, um, being we were joking about this before the recording. So a little inside joke. But being a young man, um, Pastor said he's still young. He, he ain't thinking about y'all. He's a young Very man. Young. He's got a, you know, a 20 year old. He's a pastor, full time pastor. Um, mm -hmm. And then also like a candidate for mayor. Like, so you said you talk a little bit about staffing your weakness and being humble. Is that part of what goes into to balancing all those things? It is. Um, I'll tell you um, and I won't toot my own horn and say that I'm the most balanced person because I know that I'm out of balance in other areas, like in terms of turning the switch off mm -hmm. and just having me time. I'm still learning how to do that. Um, but I'm a big, big proponent and big fan of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, I read uh, Daniel Goleman's book, and it really did change my life. Um, and I found out that I wasn't I, I wasn't operating with or exhibiting good emotional intelligence. And the more I began to delve into that and really incorporate things um, into my life and my routine, um, I began to see the areas that were out of balance. And it kind of helped me to deal with not just the way that I thought, but also the way that I respond mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. way that I respond to different types of people. Um, and that's been something that I've been very, very, um, I've been proud of, you know, and I, and I want to be better. I want to be better at it. Um, and I think pastoring any level of leadership, um, having high emotional intelligence, it helps you to make the right decisions and um, it helps you to manage your stress in a way that you're not allowing people to push you to be, to say, and to feel things that are outside of your control. So in that, in that way, that's really where that comes from for me, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's shift gears and start talking about your candidacy. Okay. All right. I'm sure you get a lot of questions about this since you're. I was just talking about it today, the top two questions, but we'll get to that later. So, yeah. <laughs> so what are some specific things that you would like to convey about the type of campaign you'd like to run, the type of mayor that you would be for the city of Louisville? Well, I think when you know, when you talk about the city, I think we have to survey where we are now. We have to look at some of the challenges and some of the outright just dangerous issues that have been allowed to um, stay in place, certain cultures. And I think when it comes to, to myself, the first thing that I say is not just from a policy standpoint, but the one thing that I'm really, really uh, looking forward to is having representation. Um, not just me being in this mayoral position, but I look at it like who I'll bring with me. Mm -hmm. um, I say this, and I really do believe it, that I'm the only candidate that will bring the level of diversity to the mayor's office that I would bring. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't say that, you know, lightly. Uh, I think that the brilliance, um, the, the level of understanding of what people are going through, Black, Brown, um, white, it doesn't matter, but, but, but especially black and brown, knowing what we're going through. Um, and then, of course, addressing, you know, which I think any serious candidate in Louisville, your, your number one thing you have to deal with is public safety. You know, and within public safety, you have to deal with the police culture. You're going to have to deal with gun violence. Um, and being someone that was born and raised here, um, someone who grew up in Newburgh, who, who lived in the West, um, who has family, you know, all through Louisville, I know the city. Um, so what I'll bring to the table is that level of knowledge. Um, and then for the last 13, 13 years, um, bringing what I've been doing to that particular platform, and that is impacting and affecting um, our community. So not just public safety, um, but really looking at affordable housing, looking at ending, not just helping, but ending the houselessness crisis in, in the city. 
um, one of my really, really sort of passionate areas is not just urban revitalization, because everybody says that, mm -hmm. but I always say, I want to bring urban revitalization without gentrification. Because for whatever reason, when you talk about revitalizing urban areas, generally that means moving out the people that are there and putting trendy things in place. So I want to deal with that. I want to deal with, uh, people may not know this, but Louisville um, for its size, if it's not number one still, it may be two or three. Uh, but we're in the top five most toxic cities. Mm -hmm. And the West End of Louisville is one of the most toxic places from soil to pollution to mm -hmm. air quality. And there's a reason why our life expectancy is 15, 20 years behind. Um, that's crazy, other areas. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's yeah, crazy. What, that's crazy what, from like from West End to East End. It's like a 15 to 20 years. Yeah. When I saw that, I was blown. It's blown, it blows me away. But then I'll tell you another thing. And I think that what sets me apart is that, you know, I am very serious. And honestly, I would say a lot of these issues all boil down to one thing. And that is we have to have someone who has a singular focus on closing as much as possible the wealth gap. Yes. Not just handouts, not just programs, not just little things here and there, but can say, in these four years that I'll be in this office, I want to make sure I do everything possible to close the wealth gap in Louisville. That, when you talk about equity, that's not something that we understand what equity is about. I just said this at a conference I was at and was speaking. Um, equity is uncomfortable. We have romanticized equity because it sounds great, just like we've romanticized Black Lives Matter until you have to start doing the work and really dealing and with equity, it means that if you're going to close this gap, it is not giving the same amount here that you give here, because then you don't close anything. You just do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What you're going to have to do is give more here to do this. Yep. And yeah. I know that that may be unpopular for some, but the truth is, um, as scientists, as statisticians have said, it is numerically impossible Yep. for us to stay on the path that we are and close the wealth gap yep. unless reparations come and come in a big way yeah that wealth gap is not going to change so all these funding of programs and all that you know i tell people all the time don't get me wrong i love financial literacy classes that way yes great yeah. <laughs> give me the money first church. though yeah come to every black church and teach financial literacy but my problem with it is this I think if anybody is financially literate, it's black folks. If anybody knows how to stretch a little bit of money mm -hmm. and stretch it for yeah. the whole month, yeah. that, that takes a level of financial literacy that you don't see in other communities. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. You've never been used to having, as Donald Trump said, a small loan of a million dollars. We <laughs> have- I can't even imagine. Somebody yeah. Here. You know, you have went to school, got your bachelor's, your master's, your doctorate, then opened up your practice, you know, did all these things with a little bit, with no help. And I think that for me, that's my responsibility. So I wanna be that candidate, I'll be that candidate that understands not just, you know, because you're, you're the mayor for all people, but, but I understand the plight of black and brown communities. And I will be the one to work toward you know, work with and really beckon those white communities to see mm -hmm. that if we're going to be this equitable, compassionate uh, city th that reaches its potential, we're going to have to not simply rely on system after system that's entrenched in racism. We're going to have yeah. to really do something different. And, um, yeah. and I think I'm the person that can do that. Yeah. You know, you bring up a, a obviously excellent points, but I was thinking about how people love to talk about diversity, you know, at every level. It's so comfortable to talk about diversity. Wow. And, you know, it kind of looks like, OK, we'll have different people who look different, different shades in, in the room. But that doesn't mean equity is taking it a step further and saying we're going to actually change the systems and turn stuff over and flip it around so that we can have equal playing field among all people and that's something that people don't want to do so my, my follow-up to that pastor is 
with equity, the, the, the quote unquote elephant in the room is somebody's got to lose a little bit others mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for for the others to, to gain. There's got to be, if you want to redistribute power, that's not sort of redistributing. You're actually taking some power away and giving other power. How do you propose to, what's the word? To, to finesse. To, <laughs> finesse. Yeah, 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 it is. How are you going to finesse that? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 that's where we have... You know, that's just one of the things that people don't like. It's like, okay, it's equity until somebody has to take to something them. away. Yeah. And so how, how is that going to be finessed? Well, I think that when we look at this in my conversation and my explanation would be this. The power and privilege that you have, why do you think it's okay for it to come at the expense of these people here? Yeah. Yeah. The, the privilege and power that you enjoy Mm -hmm. If it's coming at the expense of individuals, of students in JCPS, of people not just in the West End, but across the city of Louisville, then we'll, we're never going to become that equitable city, um, number one. Number two, the reason why I don't know if I would be as good as others in finessing that is because I would have to just have that conversation point blank and say, you didn't earn that. That was passed down to you. Right. Yeah, it may be a little difficult because now you're understanding. And again, as a pastor, as a Christian, as a believer, as a black man, as a father, I don't find it difficult to say to folks, you didn't earn that privilege. You were born with it, but you didn't earn it. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, if we want to get to this place where our city is reaching the potential that it that it can reach that benefits you as well, then you have to rethink this whole structure. And it means that there may be some things that, that are lighter coming to you on this end, but it's lifting up the city. And if a person says, I don't care about that, I just wanna lift up me. I don't care about anybody else. Well, you just showed me who you were and we're gonna do it anyway. Right, right. I Hopefully that answers that. a little bit. No, no, no it absolutely no, does. It did. It did because you know that's and that's the thing and we and we know and it's been written about from from multiple people how racism doesn't just hurt black folks it hurts white folks absolutely as well I mean that's not even up for debate so uh, you having that conversation saying hey if we do this yes we you'll give up some stuff right now but man you gain so much. Two, three, four, five, however long down the road, right? Much after that, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's where we haven't had a lot of those conversations. And I think that our political structure is in place in such a way that people are afraid to really speak to that because they don't want to lose support and votes. I've told people that I love this city. I'm here because I believe God called me to this city. Um, I'm going to be in the city and I feel like I have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I'm here not because I have political aspirations for more. I'm not here trying to make a name for myself. Uh, I'm not here because I'm power tripping. I'm here because I love Louisville. I love people. And I believe that I can do this and I can bring, I can bring people to the table that can do this. Uh, but I don't, I'm not operating on some level to where I want to be president one day. So I'm trying to maneuver. And so many times you have people that won't say what needs to be said because mm -hmm. they're thinking two and three races down the road. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There. I'm going to say, yeah. what <laughs> you know, you know, right. you know who didn't care? Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. now, I, can't, I can't stand the ground the man walks on. Pray for me. But he showed us that he was in this to help his, his folks mm -hmm. to line his pockets. But yeah. that, but he showed you and even now, a story came out that there's a good chance he's running again in 2024. Yeah, and you know what? When he does it, it's going to be competitive. Very. So, you know, I know that Black folks are a minority, and I don't use that word minority or people of color as much anymore because white women are minorities. So you got to distinguish what's what. Um, but I believe that we've got to get to a point to where we say, you know, yes, I am for all people, 
but I understand the inequities that are happening with this group of people. Mm -hmm. And in order for us all to lift this city, we all need to pay attention to what's going on here. What's going on in the criminal justice system? What's going on in the education system? What's going on in the healthcare system? What's going on in the housing system? All of these areas that have been designed to keep specific groups of people in place, it's holding the city back. Yeah. And, and, I, and I want to see that, that damn break, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so I rare to actually have a candidate that that doesn't really <laughs> well, I mean, cares, but doesn't really. It's not. It's not about being. It's not about being in government. It's, it's really just about putting the city on. That's uh, listen. You say that because, like, my mom will be the one to text me, like, "Why did you say that?" So I was on. Uh, <laughs> I was on Wave Country with John G. And it was right around the time of the January 6th um, Capitol insurrection. Oh, it's a party. Mm -hmm. It's a party. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All this stuff. Celebration. And it's a festival. Yeah. I remember being on there with Don G. And she asked me, you know, what were my thoughts on the insurrection? So I'm live on television. And I said, well, you know, it was unfortunate. But the one thing that we all got to see, and I'm very concerned about it, I think that we need to do some case studies on the level of white on white crime that we saw. We need to have a focus group to find out exactly why this white on white crime continues to happen. <laughs> that was live on television with Don G. So Don just kind of like stopped. So I get off and my mom's texting me like, yo. Don, Don, <laughs> Don G was like, <laughs> Come on, but is that not but is that not the truth? That's what they like, were saying about us. So. That's what they say about us. We, they paint pictures when, when it is convenient and it sells headlines a certain way. And then it's just, it's spoken of completely different. And I want people to know, I mean, I, I, you know, again, I can't stress this enough. I love all people and I want to see all people succeed. But I understand for us to have ultimate success in our city and really in our country, we have got to disrupt, dismantle this system that mm -hmm. is as, you know, we, we romanticize Martin Luther King. We take the I have a dream speech, which is really the I have a dream paragraph mm -hmm. and forget that the March on Washington was for jobs and justice yep. where he rallied against capitalism. Mm -hmm. And you hear so many times the, you know, Republicans talk about socialists. Well, I would challenge anybody to prove to me that Martin Luther King wasn't a socialist. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. said it. He was for and universal basic income. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You don't get more. You don't get no more socialist than that. Mm -hmm. But then you have them quoting Martin Luther King, all of those parts, but they stay far from the letters from the Birmingham jail. They don't. Mm -hmm. They don't touch them Birmingham jail letters, mm -hmm. where he talks about the complicity and the silence of individuals. So I want to be that candidate. I want to be that person. I want to be that that preacher, that community leader, that speaks truth and not simply says things to pacify masses for the purpose of votes and donations. I just, I, mm -hmm. I can't, my dad says all the time, you need to do what you can live with. Yeah. yeah. So speaking to, you shared a little bit before about some of the, you know, uh, opposition that you face. Can you talk a little bit about some of the specific challenges that you face as a pastor, as a black man Speaking as plainly as you do, can you talk about some of the specific challenges that you've had? Well, I, I think when you when you have a community that is traumatized, as traumatized as Louisville is, and I'm talking well before 2020, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that we live with levels of PTSD just based off of our daily shared life experiences. And because of that, I think that sometimes, even within our community, we tend to devour those who are doing the work. Mm. Um, there's several different reasons for that. There's, we can hypothesize all day. Um, and that can be challenging. Um, I, I'd like to think that I operate with a level of patience because I try to look deeper than just what people would say is people hating. 
but yeah. but understanding that we haven't always had um, emotionally intelligent, functioning, balanced leaders who are literally not looking for a paycheck or to or to sell out, mm -hmm. sell us out behind closed doors, but literally here, you know, we we've certainly had that. But I think that more times than not, we've had others that may have done the opposite of that. So I chalk that up to say, maybe that's where it is. You know, I, we always hear in our community, I'm sure that you all heard the crabs in the barrel analogy. Mm -hmm. and, well, and live in a barrel, though. You know, but it's like we never talk about who put them there. Mm -hmm. We always yeah. talk about the crabs in the barrel and we can harp on that and all that. That's fine. But we never say, well, the crabs are doing what crabs are going to do in that situation oh, because yeah, in in that an environment it shouldn't be in yeah. and who put them in there. So, you know, the challenge for me um, is really, and I don't even know if I'd call it a challenge, you know, just continuing to, to have patience with individuals, even if they don't see the whole picture, the big vision. Uh, but then also I would say more than that, it's learning how to exist in this space without resource. And what I mean by that, the money is in our community, yes, but I think when it comes to supporting a candidate, supporting programs, supporting these things financially, we're so used to having to just support our own that we're not even looking to the responsibility of government, mm -hmm. you know, like reparations. That is yeah. not just some, you know, pie in the sky desire. I believe that it is, again, it's biblical and we are absolutely deserve, deserving and, and, and owed rather reparations. But because we're not all there just yet, we're so used to financing our own stuff. Well, well after a while, an impoverished area that's already living under certain conditions coming and saying, I need you to do X, Y, and Z, it's just not going to be realistic. And that can be a challenge as well. So I would say those are probably the two pretty main issues, challenges, but I don't even know if I'd really call them challenges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of those, we talked about uh, some of the issues you want to focus on when in office, the wealth gap, public safety, social justice, which of those do you consider the most important? Like which one would you tackle first? Public safety. No question. Um, and a lot of, you know, when we talk about public safety and gun violence and even the rise in crime across the country, it's not something that started this year or even last year. Mm -hmm. um, people don't remember that um, several years back in the budget, they started cutting stuff. They, they cut youth programs. Yep. They cut everything. Yeah. Yep. I remember that. Of, what would have been beneficial to these 13, 14, 15, and 16 year olds, mm -hmm. they never got a chance to experience. Was it, like, um, was it the summer work program that got oh, cut a, minute, a while back too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even the Office of Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods um, has been underfunded for years. So a lot of what we're seeing are people who are already in a position um, dealing with hopeless, impoverished conditions. And then it was almost as if the government came and, and put their foot on their neck further. And what we're seeing now is the consequence of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other part I would say is public safety for me is not just shootings in the West End. Shootings in the West End are being covered first and foremost on the, on the news. Mm -hmm. But as someone who is very much connected and seen, shootings happen everywhere. Everywhere. Yes, everywhere. It's like everywhere. For, for some reason, you know, I meet people all the time and talk about how it's still dangerous downtown. When have you been downtown? My, the church that I passed is downtown. Downtown is, you got new businesses opening. It is, I, I have not seen, I mean, but there is this narrative that is out there that downtown is still burning. Yeah. And that the West End is an mm -hmm. absolute, you know, just, oh, it's oh, all the streets are there. Don't get me it wrong. It fits the narrative. So it they... fits the narrative. There yeah. are things that are happening in the West End we need to deal with, with us, certainly. But not, let's not act like all over the city. You know, when when they did that, when they removed that concealed carry permit situation with under Matt Bevan, 
Yeah. I'm I'm thinking to myself, what did you think was gonna happen? Yeah. You got you I had to get up a couple years back, maybe 17 or 18. I had to get up in my church and say, Hey, can y'all leave y'all's guns in the car? <laughs> That's Please. not an exaggeration. <laughs> we were we had people. And you know how, you know, and I have a young, I have, you know, maybe 80, 85 percent millennial church, maybe more than that. But you know how we, you know, we take selfies in the in the mirror mm-hmm. and we got to go. I'm about to go to church. It's about to be on. We started having people tag the church. They got a gun on their waist. <laughs> they in the church bathrooms, Brandon. They, they in the church nice. bathroom. They strapped for Jesus. They said, just in, they said Listen, they're like, I just in case, you. just in case the I, path to get out of line. <laughs> well, I told people this. I said, you know, talk about an active shooter situation. You would be crazy to come in the kingdom acting like you're going to do something. Okay. Like, <laughs> I had to literally get up and say, we have, we have stickers on the door right now to where a gun with a, with a little, the little the act, the... mark through it. Because now you don't have to have a permit. And to me, that kind of legislation you know, it, it's it's interesting when you do that, but then turn around and wonder why things are the way they are. Well, right. you have you have fostered this culture, this Wild West culture, and now people, you know, with a lack of communication skills and a lack of all these other things, mm-hmm. people no longer know how to have a dispute. It is a dispute and then a shooting. Right. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you think it's, you know, a lot of people... A lot of people find it hard to connect these dots. And is it because we are, our attention spans are so low? Because for me, that, that that's a simple, simple look through. Think gun, gun violence goes up as concealed carry permits become no violent. You don't need that. Uh, you know, is it, why can't we just like, connect these simple dots? I know, it, was it correlation, isn't causation, or whatever, but to me, some of these things are simple. Well, I think I'm with you. I think when you are an intuitive person, um, when you're someone who is not easily swayed by mass media, it may become easier for you to connect those dots and see it as very clear. But I think what happens, not you know, across the board in all communities, um, mass media, commercials, news coverage, talk radio, magazine, social justice stories, um, clickbait titles. It indoctrinates people and makes them think it's everything but that. Because you have major organizations and corporations behind these things, you know? If people understood, for instance, and I, you know, it's funny because I'm, um, I turned 42 in like two weeks. You know, I grew up in the Jay-Z, Biggie, Tupac era when they were at their height. I'm a huge rap fan. Now they got a 20 year old daughter. I've gotten older. I'm I'm looking at things differently. I'm looking at, wait a minute. You have all of these non-black people Mm -hmm. behind these record companies Mm -hmm. pushing music into communities Mm -hmm. for this, that, that literally provides the soundtrack for things that are going on. Mm-hmm. I look at the way, you know, there's a reason why <clears throat> critical race theory has not been taught in JCPS, but they are protesting because the mere thought that they would educate these kids mm. that America is racist at its mm-hmm. core drives them crazy because mm-hmm. it goes against the narrative. Yeah. And I think what happens to your question, Brandon, a lot of people may not, you know, it's like the movie, The Matrix. They have not gotten the pulled out. They have not waken up from The Matrix. They are still plugged in. And some people, like the guy in the movie, want to stay in. Mm. You're right. <laughs> so I think that there could be, there could be a case there, but I think it's up to people like us having these conversations to try and introduce, you know, divergent thinking and say, hey, it may not be what they're saying. Yeah. You know, yeah. I know that Candace Owens and Clarence Thomas are easy to point to and say, 
oh yeah, I'm not with them. Mm -hmm. But it may be some people on the progressive side. I mean, mm -hmm. I would encourage you all to read. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an audio book. Uh, I'm, I'm listening to the audio book. But Robin D'Angelo, who she wrote the book um, mm -hmm. White Fragility. Yeah. She had a brand new book out called Nice Racism. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. And the mm -hmm. whole book is about racist, nice, white progressives. Yes. They, they yes. march with you. They mm -hmm. say no justice, no peace with you. Mm -hmm. But in their heart, they're doing you a favor. Mm -hmm. And they are, I mean, it is. And she and Robin D'Angelo is a white woman. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. she and I was, Robin D'Angelo is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Read that, read the book, listen to it on audiobook. If you download the app, it gives you a free credit. Use the free credit to download nice racism. <laughs> nice yes. racism. Absolutely. No, that's that's good stuff. And I think that um, I mean, I think all of us here appreciate the the way that you talk in the straightforward way. And I think at the, in the same way, the people who want to be stuck in the matrix, that's what awakens all that rage and fragility, you know? Yeah, um, white rage. That yes, Carolyn Anderson's book. Absolutely. White rage. White that's rage. Enough. Yeah. For every, for, sure. for every step of advancement, the, the reason the why we got rage. Donald Trump was because of Barack Obama. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have to ask, would would pass? Would, so okay. So in terms of you, if you get the mayor mayor position, where would that leave you with your church? Would you continue to be the pastor of Kingdom Absolutely. Fellowship? How Ooh. would you balance those two things? What well, that I, I like? think that I think that people have a, a view of being a mayor or being a senator or a congressman, um, but specifically a mayor, that you're working 50, 60 hours a week. You're not. The reason why we always lament politicians always on the golf course, because as as the mayor, certainly you work hard. You're showing up to things. You're making decisions for the good of the city. Um, but how you spend your time is largely about how you organize yourself or organize your schedule. And for me, um, you know, I have a great leadership team at the church. I have amazing associate pastors, amazing leadership team. And there are things now that are already in place that allow me not to be uh, in a position to where I have to do everything at all times. Mm -hmm. okay. So if I want to take, you know, two weeks off in the month, we have developed and we have amazing, strong associate pastors mm -hmm. who can move, continue, continue to do what they, what they do and, and so on and so forth. You know, I look to as my great inspiration, someone who I, I think he's a phenomenal person, um, Raphael Warnock, mm -hmm. you know, he just, he's, he's um, in the Senate and he is still pastor and for the most part still preaches every Sunday. Hmm. So yeah. um, I would absolutely continue to uh, pastor kingdom fellowship. Um, certainly there would be um, more accountability and we would groom others to step up and really, as we're doing now, to step up and you know be able to do, but that's really the church should be like that anyway. I think where we got in trouble with the church mm -hmm. is when we made the church about one person all mm -hmm. the time. They're the face of it, they're the this of it, and nobody else. Mm -hmm. And I've never wanted that. You know, I tell I tell my church, listen, there is a retirement date. I, I don't listen. One day I am going to retire from pastoring. I'm not going to be ninety. I'm not going to be seventy. <laughs> about about sixty five. <laughs> I'm gonna find myself yes. in Aruba. I'm always, I will always be a preacher. I'm gonna always come in. I'll be 90. If you let me, I'm gonna come in there in my cane, preach at your church. <laughs> I'll be pastor emeritus of kingdom. But I'm not gonna be pastoring as a senior citizen. You know, I'm gonna be no, somewhere on. Bad. You know, listen, I'm gonna be somewhere writing books, maybe teaching somewhere, and uh, you know, and and grew and have would have groomed my successor. I'm 42. I'm at now to where I should be looking to see who's coming after me. Mm -hmm. Now I'm hitting my prime, but you would think, why would you, as you're hitting your prime in pastor years, be looking for your successor? Because that's the way it's supposed to go. 
-hmm. and set that person up, whoever that might be, to go further than I went. Mm -hmm. That's that's yeah. the point of this. And I think when you when you're so self focused, it's always about you. Every it rises and falls with you. You walk in the church, you got my picture there the, with the with the eyes that follow you, yeah. and it just I don't want that. I, I want <laughs> I want to make sure that this is for my children, grandchildren, their children, and that, you know, we have a healthy succession plan in place. And I think that's what separates um, organizations and churches that are going somewhere from those who are just kind of dying on the vine. Well, you know, not, I'm not sure if we are, if we're ready to switch gears a little bit, uh, but you kind of open, opened it up a little bit. So how, how are you, how are you all staying relevant? Like, you know, we post COVID, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I ain't got to go to church, you know, 11 o'clock Sunday or 12 o'clock Saturday, Saturday, anything like that. <laughs> I go to church Wednesday at 9 p.m. I ain't got to, I ain't got to step foot in your walls no more. Like what, what, what's keeping you rather, what's keeping people coming back, especially as you have mentioned that your church is 80, 85% millennial, who in theory would have access to all of these different uh, mediums uh, to consume church. But yet, uh, from what you're saying, Church is still, church is still, for lack of a better phrase, booming. Yeah, well, no, real. I mean, we today we were filled on the floor and up in the balcony. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and this is and I tell people this all the time. You always hear about these, the, you hear these statements that people are leaving the church, and to a to a certain degree, there's some truth in that. But what we have to do, and this is just another thing, because you can't say that this goes in education and this goes in healthcare, but it doesn't also go in the church. You have to be careful about where you get your information from. What you find out, and I have a friend of mine in Dallas, Texas, who is one of the only um, Black researchers trained and, and, and has her own company and it's just phenomenal. And she's got actual numbers that in the black church, the, the amount of people that are leaving in terms of millennials and young people is far smaller than mm -hmm. those in the white church. And you would never think that, but you read all the time. And what we do is on social media, because we may have out of our 5,000, 3,000, 2,000 friends list, we got five that are on our timeline every day talking about they ain't going to church no more. And we think with those five, Ain't nobody doing it. It's, it's over. When that is that is not true whatsoever. Um, to answer your question, you know, post COVID, what am I doing? Well, number one, when we came back, we didn't shut down the online thing. We mm -hmm. said, "Hey, you want to stay online? Stay online." Matter of fact, you know what we're gonna do? If you go to our website, you'll see this. We're gonna start an internet church satellite location. Wow. Where you will get, you're going to get your own stuff, your own programming. You got your own, even on Sunday mornings when you're watching on service, you know how church we pray with people and you may just request prayer. Well, you're on the internet. How do you get that? Mm -hmm. We have live numbers where when I give the prayer invitation, we have people that literally get up, leave the sanctuary, go into a room downstairs and wait for the phone to ring. And we have several numbers you can call and get prayer. Because we want mm. people to know from across the country or even in the city, if you're a part of the streaming, we call it uh, Kingdom Life Digital. If you're a part of the Kingdom Life Digital campus, that's fine. You you still get, you know, we launched KTV, Kingdom Television. So every Tuesday from 3 to 6 p.m., we have half an hour block shows. And it's not just preaching. It's live shows of, we got our drama ministry that puts on skits like a show, and we try to get people to watch that. We got all these different things because we said, you know what? Let's use what's been given to us. But the yeah. second thing that I would say is my, my goal is to make it to where you want to be there. Mm -hmm. I say to you, hey, stay online. But I want you to be at home and seeing the service from the angles to the people to where you say, I got, I got to get there. <laughs> even if you don't sit online, <laughs> even if you don't sit online, you're thinking, man, I, I want to, I want to be in there. And yeah. I just say, essentially, I'm gonna wait you out. 
I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to shortchange you on the Internet church. But I think if I do and we do what we're supposed to do well enough. You going you know, even you come in there with five masks on sit in the balcony, you gonna find your way in there. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and the other thing we did is that we polled very early and pushed vaccines. Mm-hmm. So I want to say. Uh, May. Yeah, I think May or yeah, maybe May, the mid part of May, 73 percent of our congregation was fully vaccinated. Seventy mm-hmm. three. Because I was up saying, um, it, and I'm, you know, I'm just straightforward. I was like, yo, um, I love y'all, but I got to get the shot. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not saying I'm a bar you from coming in because I would never do that. But I'm not, not but saying. I'm just, <laughs> just saying. Not with this Delta a, plus plus out. No. Yeah, you don't need to get this vaccination because you have to stay back. <laughs> yeah. So. We've seen that. So we have the vast majority of our attendees. And I mean, that's a lot of people. Mm-hmm. They're fully vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. again, I'm I'm watching very, very close this variant. Because the other thing is, I don't play with COVID. So the moment I look on TV and it says we're in an outbreak, because we're we're set in a way that we can transition everything back to online wow. like that. Yes. So we've right. done and that's like a it's a lot because I'm I'm sort of a germaphobe. My my people will tell you I'm a big germ, but I, I don't think I'm, I'm just you know that's just me. You're not so, alone here. <laughs> yeah, I don't listen. My food don't touch. I don't drink after people. Oh no! I've been, no, yeah. listen. Thank I you. keep sanitizer with me. Oh, yeah, food touching. Yeah, my food like yeah. my at Thanksgiving. Food don't yeah, my, at Thanksgiving, my family brings out compartment Yes, yeah, I don't do My food yeah. segregated. Listen, um, Brandon, when I was when I traveled. I have my own straw. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Don't give Where's them it? ideas. Don't give I them ideas. Own, like, I'm not using any straw. Listen, when I go to a restaurant and they bring the drink with the straw in there, I'm like Jesus about to flip the tables up. Like what? what is <laughs> no, I have my own straw. Like I don't play them games. He break out his um, little straw. Like hold on, wait a minute. I got my own. <laughs> yeah, I'm like no, 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 no. Bring me a whole nother cup. Don't bring no straw. I'm good. Uh, but if the variant goes off and it and it becomes an issue, you know we're we're ready to transition back to whatever we need to transition to. So, you know, you have to have a contingency plan at all times. So in that, I mean, I I love some of the ideas that have come out of this and, and your way of thinking, your church's way of thinking, because you know I want to ascribe that to you and your team. Since you said it takes a whole team to, to mm-hmm. keep the fellowship running like that, what would you tell um, other pastors who may not have had such great luck with this during COVID or who may be trying to get their groove as we're reopening or whatever, what kind of advice would you give them about trying to incorporate some of these technologies or how to, how to bring in millennials? Cause you seem to be doing a really good job of that in a time where people are saying millennials don't go to church, you know, sounds like you got a lot of them. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that when you talk about millennials and um, I'll give an example, I tweeted this weekend, um, the Breeway basketball team. Mm -hmm. They they started a basketball team and our church um, bought the basketballs for them. One of the things that, and not just millennials, but really conscious people that love Christ and understand and love community want to see churches involved in community. Mm -hmm. The days of, that's a big thing for millennials. I'm 41, so I'm right outside of millennials. All I know is community engagement. So even when I talk to pastors, it sometimes is strange trying to explain community engagement. I I do it and I want to make sure that I do it well, but it comes second nature for me. So I think that's a very, very important aspect. Um, And I would say from a practical standpoint, it's not just getting a group in your church to be your social justice ministry. When I say becoming community activated, it is the entire church. Mm. You're preaching, you're teaching, what you're leading the entire church to do. That's what is going to attract those because they Mm. wanna see that you love people. 
you know, they want to see that you love community. Mm -hmm. So I would say that. And then I would say just if you don't have that kind of thinking, but you desire that kind of reality, you have to get out of the way. Yeah. What I mean by that is stay, you stay past them. I don't mean step down. What I mean is you've got to empower people, empower men and women who they do this or they think like that. Allow them to take risk, allow them to do these things and allow them to lead it. And you support them as pastor and it will revolutionize and change your church. And as much as I'm community oriented, community driven, I have people in the church that, think, you know, there's a young lady. Um, I had an idea and we do it now for the last six or seven years. It's called Love Evolution. We do it mm -hmm. every year in October. And for the whole month, we know it's Love Evolution. It's become so big now because we had a young lady that has a heart for serving. She took that thing and now it is a week long, just, we just give, give mm -hmm. to people. We have everything from, I mean, last year or year before last, we had job fair, closed closet, health screenings, um, and a bunch of other stuff inside and out in one day and saw hundreds upon hundreds upon thousands of people come through. And I literally may have went to like one meeting. Yeah. They did all of it. But what I didn't do was trip and say, I got to see all this. And I got to do all this. And I got to make sure. I said, no, you're gifted to do this. Here's your budget. Here are the parameters that we want to make sure that, that we stay within this sort of culture. And she did it. And it was amazing. And to this day, mm -hmm. we have people that joined the, joined the church from that mm -hmm. who are now members. And now this yeah. year, they're going to work in Love Evolution 2021. And then they'll make disciples. And that's sort of, to me, that's, that's how things are supposed to run. I think you have a lot of leaders who would hear what you're saying. Um, and be like, you're speaking a different language. I, I, as somebody and, you know, all of us, we've been in church all of our lives, you know, and so seeing leaders who I would say, some of them who get into it because of the centering of themselves, you know, mm -hmm. and so it's big. exactly like <laughs> this is why I'm here is to, to be seen. And so to, to, to decenter yourself and to prioritize the community and, you know, serving the people and not just bringing folks in, but you going out. Um, it's so well, amazing. I mean, I'm a I different think, kind yeah. of pastor, you know. I wear a Brianna Taylor t shirt and I am. Um, I know. Like, I, know. Like, See, I mean, he got you, big know, dogs. Just, you know, he got, yeah, big I got dogs. Two shoes. <laughs> yeah, so I think I'm just different anyway. So. <laughs> I can about, appreciate I think, about, do, you, do you feel this is the way that I'm seeing things, though? I'm seeing that there are more, they're becoming more pastors starting to be quote unquote different. You know, you look at, you know, some of your quote unquote gospel rappers who are more in the word than some of your pastors now. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's a new breed of leadership that's starting to disrupt the whole quote unquote church model. Yeah, I would say that. And I think that of that new breed, you have people who are more about the work than they are about the hype. Yeah, And I think that the hype for so many is the stage on Sunday, the adulation of the people. But I think there is a group that has come up that's seen we're failing or we're being harmed in all these categories that are outside of the church. Mm -hmm. So we out here, you know, in the lights on Sunday, preaching and teaching things that are not connecting to people. And many of us, we sat under those kinds of, uh, you know, of terms, so to speak. And when the Lord called us, a part of that call was, no, you, you've got to affect the community before you check out of here. You got to do as much good for as many people as humanly possible. And that's essentially how I view, you know, my assignment and my purpose. And that is whatever room he sends me into, whatever level he opens the door for me to go to, my role is to help, to, to, to bless, 
to free, liberate, to disciple as many people as possible and see their lives change. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I think that's what a lot of people now, this, this new breed, that's sort of how we look at things, you know? And, that, and that's not to cast any aspersions on those who came before us because many of my mentors have been so instrumental just even in my formation and, and how I've grown um, both as a man, a preacher, an activist, a community leader. Um, and I appreciate those who came before me. Um, but I think with my generation and even those who will come after me, we're standing on their shoulders, but we're trying to reach as high as we can reach. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing things that maybe traditionally have been, you know, really not in our realm. I'll isn't, say that. Isn't that every generation has that story? At some point in time, they're pushing against whatever the tradition is of those who are older than them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I would say at least yeah. for this, for this, for our generation, I guess, Pastor, I'll include you in that for the time being, since you're part of the millennials. So for this part, <laughs> barely. <laughs> I see a lot. Of, I see differently. I know I hear that a lot of being yeah, millennials not in church. Millennials are not doing anything. I just see a lot of millennials working. Um, and I do feel that I think that I think we're in the space now, especially post COVID, where I don't just want to be in your building one day a week for the song and the sermon. What else are you doing for the community? Well, how, right. how are you helping? What else are you doing to engage? And you don't have to give us the credit. Just put, tell me where I can work. Just put me in. Like, yeah. 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 I'm seeing a lot more of that and a lot more of the stripping away of the how you come, to, how you dress when you come to church and. You know, who's sitting here and who's sitting over there? It's more of just like, show me where I can work. Mm -hmm. Let me get involved. You got a lot yeah. of great young people with wonderful ideas, which it sounds like you're putting those folks to work in your congregation. And it's just like, if we could just get more of that, I don't think it's millennials running away from church. I just think they don't feel fed, not just. Yeah. Fed, but you're a hundred percent right. Yeah. And I think you made a point that's so true. And I've seen it. I experience it. And people ask about it all the time. But folks come through and say, hey. I want to work and I don't want to work one day a week on Sunday morning as an usher. I want to help feed people. I want to know where's the clothes closet. Mm -hmm. I want to go out here and do this. And we've developed opportunities for people to do that. And I think that's another way that we've seen this sort of population explode in our church. Yeah. And I, I think for us too, we are not, um, we're not as concerned or we're not, um, uh, impressed by all the patriarchy and all the systems and all the levels right. and if we feel disrespected or we feel like we're not getting fed then we will leave but that yeah. doesn't mean Quickly. that we don't want to be there we just want to right. we, we find we want to go somewhere where we can where we can get fed and do what it is you know it's going to make absolutely. us feel part of the community so i think that's a misconception as yeah well. no you're you're absolutely yeah. right <laughs> and, and that's the even when it comes to the whole people going to the church in their neighborhood them days are gone. Folk, you know, we have people right now. Matter of fact, we have a young lady who just moved to um, in the, in Nashville. But they were driving from K-State to our church mm -hmm. every Sunday. Mm -hmm. We have people that drive from Lexington yeah. every Sunday now. So people are going to go where they're fed. So you're absolutely, absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yep. I drive about 45 minutes Saturday. <laughs> There's a church up the street, but it's not quite what we need. So yeah. we go find <laughs> And that's and that's the thing. And that's what's so important. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Pastor Philly, with everything we've talked about, we have to know how in the world do you take care of yourself? What do you do? What are the things that you do? Um, oh, yeah, but once, yeah. but once he's speechless, but yeah. once he's like, oh. I'll say I'm just now, me and my brother, um, and he's, he's further along than I am, but golf has become something that I really, really like. Um, I used to play basketball and I played, you know, even as a pastor, just, I was playing a lot in my free time. Uh, but of course, getting older, my nephew, who's 19, plays for Campbellsville University. And the last time I played him was about a year and a half ago. And I was trying really, really hard. Like I was playing really hard, sweating. And he just, he destroyed me. <laughs> he, he literally destroyed me without even breaking a sweat. I don't, even, I don't even think he took off the sweats. 
<laughs> so at that point, I stopped playing basketball <laughs> and started gravitating. Yeah, because I was like, no, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to do that ever again. <laughs> so I'd say bas- I'd say golf. Um, I-, I love to travel. Uh, but to be honest, the reason why there's sort of a hesitation is because that's an area where I'm still learning. You know, um, I don't do that the best. And I'm like a lot of people that, um, you know, it's time generally when it's past time, mm-hmm. you own edge and you feel in your, usually it's my staff that lets me know. They're like, all right, okay. you need to go on vacation. No, we need to work with you. Right, yeah. You don't pay time right. You're doing too much. You got to go. Right. Yeah. So go. that's literally where I hit. They'll be like, all right, it's been, it's been a couple months and uh, <laughs> you in here mad about the dust. So. <laughs> no, like real talk. I'll be like, you know what? We got a staff meeting right now. The dust is so much dust. And they'll be like, man, you got to go. You got to But, go. um. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, You're working I'm, I'm on trying it. to do better with that. Yeah, I am. Well, that's our hope for you as a show that talks about self-care every week. Yes. And mm-hmm. that you develop more self-care strategies because you just, you need that. We all do. And a, and a pause for a station identification. Brandon is 60 to 45. Bucks are up. You know what? This is so, 60 to 45. You know, it's crazy. Right. Half time. I mean, Appreciate we, can't you. Even, we can't even get mad because we're <laughs> talking about self care, right? That's my self care after this show. That's self care. You know That's self care. <laughs> <laughs> you said we was going to let them watch the second half. So, okay, fine. Well, it's half time, so we good. We, we good. good. We got like five to seven minutes now. <laughs> you know what? Listen, before, before we, um, is there any other questions or anything that we want to ask before we go to where we can? find before we ask uh pastor Philly where we can find him on so, the social medias or you know what have you. there are so many questions because i know like my friends i stick to my script so i wasn't all over the place well i'm sorry <laughs> well, i'm not good at that the conversation flow like you flow it and it i love it, it oh, i love it <laughs> you know what and y'all's questions have been very professional and you know sometimes i'll do these shows and they'll say Pastor, we're going to ask you about this and that. And within five minutes, it's like, now let's ask you this. <laughs> and it's like, okay. <laughs> you know. Hey, hey, Pastor, for real, for real, we're not trying to get canceled. We're not trying to get you canceled. We are. No, we good. We ain't trying to. <laughs> well, I did have one of those questions. I ain't going to ask. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let it go. Listen, um, when the Lord. When the Lord <laughs> opens that door and shows me, I'm gonna move down that in that direction. I'm gonna stay as pastor of Kingdom Fellowship. What's the other thing? Um, you know, I've just been focused. Now, if you take those three things I just said, you can apply those to three different questions. Three different questions. <laughs> <laughs> those three things. Okay. I'm just gonna go on record and ask a little bit later, a little further along in the candidacy, would you be willing to come back and maybe do some more? I'd love to. Okay. I would sure. absolutely love to. I appreciate this. I love the show. And uh, y'all call. I'm there for sure. We appreciate it. And, you know, I did want to say you were talking earlier about the patriarchy, Simone. I appreciate mm-hmm. pastors that don't have to tell you they're a pastor. Thank you. I Just be the pastor. Just You are Tim that just so happens to be a pastor. Yes. yes. Listen, that is 100%. I tell people all the time, when you see me out in public, you know, you ain't got to hit me with man of God. You ain't got to be weird. <laughs> you know, just God's be like, anointed. yo, what up? God's anointed. Like, just be like, what up? <laughs> like, I get a little bit of everything. And I'd be like, yo, it's it's cool. It's cool. I'm, I'm Tim. It's all good. You know, you don't, you don't take away from my anointing. And it, I don't take it as disrespect if you address me by my name. It's mm-hmm. all good. <laughs> you know? This show. So, it's yeah. just you know, but I grew up. I grew up in church, so I understand it, and I try not. You know, some people, I get it, and they want. And I'm, and I don't fight against that at all. Uh, my grandmother, you know, who just passed, but she was big on. They call you Pastor mm-hmm. Finley. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell people, if y'all see her around, say Pastor Finley. Yes. <laughs> in my office, I'm Tim. It's all good. But when she's around now. Unless you want that walker into your knee. <laughs> I love it. So where can we find you? Where can people find more information about you, your campaign, um, whatever? 
I think you yeah, know, well, as well, yeah, I'm on it? social media. I'm on every social media platform. But what really counts right now is that everyone would go to www.findley, F-I-N-D-L-E-Y, the number four mayor, findleyformayor.com. The name of the game right now is fundraising. Mm -hmm. And what will what will really help, what will send a message to the powers that be in this city um, is us continuing to come together. And it's if it's $5, 10 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month, um, Findley for Mayor, it's, it's in the um, bio of, of all Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. But, but being a, a monthly contributor would be amazing. And on that website, you'll see what I stand for, um, what, my, what the issues are, um, and a little bit about me. And, um, and I'm pretty accessible. So I'm around the city with no security. You know, I'll be in the malls. You know, my team gets mad at me. But, you know, I'm out here. I'm, I'm me. I grew up in this city. That's going to be a transition for me, too. But, you know, I'm 6'4", 250. So you run up on me. <laughs> I'm just yeah, saying. And the, and the dogs. <laughs> just the dogs. Yeah. take the dogs. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying. I'll, I'll tell people all the time. I'm not your granddaddy's pastor. I'm in my prime. You know, you run up, you're you done up. To, you might have to take them signs off your doors with the guns. You might, you might need some armor wearers for you. Hey, well, I got that. I got, I have that. And I do have a phenomenal team around me. Um, but really right now, like I said, if we just getting that support, you know, go to the website. If you want to volunteer, if you want to be a part of the mailing list, you can do that on the website as well. And uh, again, I just appreciate you all for the opportunity. Um, just allowing me to come on and talk a little bit. We appreciate having you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thank you so uh, much. <laughs> so great to have Pastor Finley on with us. Wonderful conversation. Yeah. Um, we might let Brandon go so he can watch the game. I don't know. We don't let Brandon go. We don't minutes. let him go. Uh, we can have a it longer discourse about the show. and We should just stay another 30, 40 minutes. What do you no, we should. I'm hungry. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, okay. The baby is spoken. The baby is right. hungry. I'm all eating but, food. She ain't going to wait too, long, too much longer. I'm going to start eating on camera. Um, that was wonderful. I loved it. I had That's such good. a good time. And I was nervous about it. But we, it was, he fell down to earth. It wasn't nothing. Yeah. yeah. It was great. It was yeah. nice talking with Tim. Who just with Tim. Master. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. So this this all American recap, do we want to do that? I just Ooh. very quickly. Yeah. Ooh, all what do y'all think? I think, you know, they have been I, I enjoyed the episode, number one. Um, I loved what they did around homecoming, which always gets a little bit sketchy when you start doing homecoming episodes at HBCUs because fraternities and sororities, they get in their feelings about things and misrepresentation. Um, but I think it did yeah. a good job of showing a little bit of Greek life without stepping on anybody's culture and yep. um, showing like the, the community um, that really happens at HBCUs that some people just don't get to experience. So I thought that I thought it was a wonderful episode. I mm -hmm. hope this, this is a spinoff. I'll watch this. If it's, if this is a spinoff, I'll watch it. I will watch it. I would definitely watch it. And I, and I agree with this. I think the less is more dynamic because, you know, so it was great because so many times you want to go super deep into everything into into the parties into this and that they just did it was real surface yeah and i think that was a very good move on their part and so yeah i i, I like it you know I, I, I do i think we're gonna have some simone and jordan issues though in the next episode i'm here for that i'm here for the oh. issues i'm like listen your parents told you you shouldn't have got married, but it took you going to to Atlanta for Simone to start having some what seems like Second some thoughts. reservations about being uh, married. It, like, it, it didn't seem. It didn't seem. She was definitely having some second thoughts. You know, yeah. I read that differently. I felt like Simone was kind of firm in her I got a man stance. I think it was I think Jordan's realization that she may be going there. Like I think that they're the the college choice is gonna, what's going to break them up because he has said several times my dream is to be in California to play in California. Mm -hmm. That's true. Before this weekend, she was going away to a different school. So I think there's a that issue has never left of like where y'all going to college is in vastly different areas. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 
It's just that that other guy kept showing up and she oh, kept entertaining the conversation. She kept entertaining. She kept entertaining. Like, she didn't walk away. That's the thing. That's the thing. She kept entertaining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is an unpopular opinion. Mm -hmm. I was not down for the whole dance scene. Like, for real. Y'all come. Y'all come. I liked it, but I thought, really? So y'all just learned all the moves in an hour and now y'all know all the... And not only that, but you're in the front. You're in the front. In the front. I thought, okay, go sit down. This is giving me musical vibes, and I love oh, that. That was the only that was the only unrealistic part. I, I, like, give that. I thought they was gonna be background dancers, right? <laughs> right. So yeah, um, excited to see it. Next. I mean, the way the show set up, I feel like we could really have ten more episodes. There's so many unanswered questions, mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah. So I thought it was a great episode. We probably got two more. What two or three? I'm thinking the football game championships. And then probably the wedding, if there is a wedding. <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. I'm just happy we got a uh, Spencer, Olivia, a Spivia or something back together again. Oh, yeah, but what about Coop? Together. No, not Coop. Uh, what's his name? The guy with the daughter. Preach. Oh, Preach. Yeah, we need to get back. We got to find out about the daughter. We got to figure out. And what Mo why. was trying to do, because Mo was trying to get, is trying to mess Coop up. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, right. we, got, we need like five more episodes. I hope she ain't setting him up and this little girl's not his kid. That'd be terrible. That'd might be, terrible. be. Might be. Might be. So we ready to move to gratitude? Y'all got other all American things. Yeah, we go to gratitude. <laughs> what y'all grateful for? Brandon's grateful we're gonna hurry up and wrap the show up so you can watch the game. <laughs> no, man, you know, I was uh my kids got on my nerves today, right? And so well, well, this is the gratitude, right? I uh, know my kids got on my nerves because I was, you know, really, really intrigued. This is like my first weekend. That's not a uh, holiday weekend, you know, with them. Like, all day. All day. All day, yes. Or well, most of the day, yes. And I'm grateful that I can actually, I do actually have that time. Yeah. And we'll be able to, you know, go and do things and take trips and go to little outings and do this, do this, that, and the other. So, uh, their swimming lessons got moved to be earlier, so start their swimming lessons are at eleven thirty. So we'll really have like the whole day to kind of kind of do whatever, you know. So we're gonna take that cultural pass and uh, we'll do all the free stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I'm grateful um, that well we're recording this on Sunday, so when I say yesterday, I mean Saturday. Um, I'm grateful that yesterday I got to go to my grandmother's house and have dinner like normal things. I haven't been over there on a Saturday after church in a year and a half. It's been mm. forever. It's unheard of. And that's that's our family thing. You know, my um, grandmother lives in the family house. So like going over there after church is, that's what you do, you know, when things were normal before COVID. So returning back to some sense of normal, it was nice to be over the house yesterday and have dinner and talk with my mom and grandma. So I'm just grateful for that. I'm thankful to be getting to, or I'm already at 31 weeks of pregnancy. This pregnancy has flown by. We've had health and safety this entire time. And we're just very grateful for that because as we know, that's not the case for millions and millions of people. Um, so I don't take that for granted at all. Um, so grateful for that. And also grateful for this conversation. Um, again, we said this a million times. We did not expect for this show to do the things that it's done to educate, to create a platform uh, for ourselves and for other people to come on and talk about stuff. Um, it's just a blessing. So I'm very thankful for for what we have done, what we're doing. Legit. Selfishly, I'm learning a lot from all of this. That's Absolutely. On a, on a whole. Mm -hmm. Me too. You know, early inceptions of this episode of these this show we were like i don't know five to ten episodes <laughs> maybe maybe yeah. and the side eyes the haters <laughs> i'm talking about my mama <laughs> well why would you do that y'all want why? why y'all who's gonna that? watch it we've had some and i'm like you you mom and she watches it <laughs> all the time. every week <laughs> Well, we've had some really good conversations on the show. We've had some wonderful guests. We're always thankful to the folks who are willing. And, you know, we started out, we tapped a lot of our friends to be guests. But yes. now we have branched out to a lot of people that we have become friends with, I would say, more because of this show. 
Um, but I definitely, definitely appreciate all the conversations. Um, and, you know, I want to harp on what Pastor Finley Shirt said, you know, the wonderful picture of Breonna Taylor. We always want to ask yes. for justice for Breonna Taylor. We are still in need of that. I see some, I see some officers getting fired, but I, I need some more things. And more. more. Things. Yes. We want to sure. remind you when the Delta, the Delta plus plus squared is still out here. So please wash your hands. The Delta extreme, put your mask on. Okay, please. Please do all those things. Wash your hands, put your mask on. We're not, we're not quite past it yet. It's, things are better, no lie, but. Mm -hmm. We've seen things get better and then get worse. And we don't want to do that. And yeah. please, please. Yeah. So until next time, Brandon. We remain yours. We remain yours. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Good night.